Bliss and Grit is an entirely listener-supported show. Supporting us is also designed to support you through keeping the episodes rolling, but also through rewards for your donation, like a getting started guide, a private forum, and downloadable meditations. To become a supporting member, you can visit patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. Hello, beautifuls. You're listening to Bliss and Grit. I'm Brooke Thomas, and I'll be joined soon by my dear friend and co-host, Vanessa Scotto, as well as our special guest today, Locke Kelly. On the show, we're talking about being on the embodied spiritual path and what does that actually mean? What is a real evolution of our lives? How do we ultimately embrace everything, all the beauty and crazy, the joys and the messes, the bliss and the grit that is a human life? So as I mentioned, we are thrilled today to be having a conversation with Locke Kelly. Locke is the author of the book Shift into Freedom and the creator of the recent audio course offering through Sounds True titled Effortless Mindfulness Now. He is a meditation teacher, psychotherapist, and founder of the nonprofit Open Hearted Awareness Institute. Locke has collaborated with neuroscientists at Yale, UPenn, and NYU, and has been teaching seminars, supervising clinicians, and practicing awareness psychotherapy in New York for 30 years. It's also important to mention that he teaches in our very favorite lineage, the human being lineage, which makes him a perfect teacher to have on Bliss and Grit. We so admire how he talks about awakening as just a really normal developmental potential for all human beings and how his approach is so practical and available. We talk about how the answer to any question related to relieving suffering is always the same, shift. And we discuss how to shift. Locke offers several experiential practices throughout our conversation, so it's great because you don't get to just hear about it. You can actually play with it and experience it for yourself. Uh, There's a lot of goodies in the episode, so instead of spilling them all out, let's just dive in so you can get an actual taste of what he's talking about. Before we hop into the conversation, if you're enjoying the show, we would of course love it if you left a review on iTunes or on our Facebook page, which is Bliss and Grit. You can head over to the website, blissandgrit.com to subscribe. We put out a weekly digest on Fridays of whatever resources we're currently texting each other and loving. And as you heard at the very beginning, you can become a supporting member at patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. And we are oh so very grateful to those of you who are already supporting us over there. I think we have 82 of you now. Very thankful. Okay, here we go. Thank you so much, Locke, for joining Vanessa and I today. We're so excited to talk with you. Yeah, great to be here. Nice to meet you both. I'm looking forward to a great dialogue and trialogue. Yes, trialogue. (laughs) I know it's a unique aspect of this podcast is figuring out who's talking when. So we'll do it imperfectly. It'll be whatever it is. Yeah. And I know that in our conversation, a lot of what we're going to be talking about and pointing to is something that people sometimes use the word awakening for. And we've found in our conversations with teachers that people use that word differently. Teachers use it differently. And of course, students and practitioners use it differently. So maybe a good place to start is just how you mean that word. What are you pointing to when you use that word? Yes. Okay. That's a good, uh, good place to start. I mean, on a simple level, uh, <clears throat> the feeling of it is kind of the word is used because it's a shift that feels like you're asleep and then you awaken. So it's almost as if you've Then a dream character (laughs) in your dream of life going around thinking that there are monsters and there are a lot of threatening characters. And when you awaken, you have a bigger view, uh, a bigger view of what is still uh, real, but maybe not true, meaning the, the situations are the same, but they don't seem as uh, threatening and kind of real, but not you. So the what really changes is the kind of feeling of identity that you shift from a very small sense of self, almost, <clears throat> well, yeah, the other way to talk about it is really almost to feel like the way we live is in a type of consciousness that, I could talk about it developmentally and I can talk about it spiritually and I could talk about it in different ways. 
but what it tends to feel like when people describe it, if they really feel what they're, where they're located during the day is almost as if they're, we're in a cloud of consciousness or there's <clears throat> people who are more mental type almost feel like there's a little mini me behind their eyes looking out and commenting or there's not just one mini me, it's actually a, a group or a little committee <laughs> that's commenting and they're all sitting in the seat of, of the self, the CEO seat they keep rotating through and debating who should be sitting there. And then uh, that consciousness is very small. So it's not even our body and our personality that we're waking up from. That's kind of an interesting, important point. That that kind of remains basically the same except calmer and less, you know, anxious, more, you know, fear-free and more shame-free, which is probably the most important identity piece. But that feeling of this... <clears throat> small sense of self that we tend to try to just clean it up with positive self-help and, you know, growing up processes, which are all very important learning. Uh, but that if we, if we stay within that small um, ego based system of identity, um, it's really too small a system to deal with a full emotional life. It's too small to deal with an intimate life with a feeling of of the fullness and its perception feels like we're separate. There's a separate sense of self that feels like we're cut off. Therefore, we feel lonely. We feel anxious. We fear fearful of energy and not only things like moving objects, which you should be afraid of somewhat, <laughs> sure. or at least move out of the way. I don't know if you have to be afraid of them, but... Be quick. <laughs> it's better that way. But the the other the other feelings are as if we're scanning for danger all the time, not even protecting our body and our personality, but protecting this little mini me system that has co opted our boundary program and thinks as if there's a small separate self that needs to get something to eat to be okay, and it needs to get something someday, if I only get this, then I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. But that's not even about like, oh, don't be so greedy. It's like, it's greedy. <laughs> and it thinks it's you. It's <laughs> not even that you think it's it. you're it. <laughs> it thinks yeah. it's you and it's, yeah. it's taken over. And you don't even know it. And then it's operating your, <laughs> your body mind and your perception is, is clouded or like horse blinders, and that is your reality. And then we just kind of muddle along, doing the best we can. And so awakening is is literally um, stepping out of the cloud. One way that I kind of have found is the simplest, most direct way is feeling as if awareness, which is identified or attached, can open out of the cloud or drop down deeper, or open up higher, or take a half step back to look back through that pattern until you feel this more spacious, aware, and then embodied, interconnected feeling of a sense of being. And it's almost like you drop from head to heart mind, and you open to a field of awareness that isn't spacey, uh, but spacious and has this remarkable quality of intelligence and also kind of unconditional love. Like there's some support um, from what people feel like a lot of religious language is about that support or that feeling of lack of support when they don't connect to that something greater than themselves. So the awakening is to a dimension of reality and the premise in the kind of tradition that I'm in, and the main tradition I'm in is called the human being lineage. <laughs> My <laughs> favorite <love> lineage. <laughs> <laughs> Which means yeah. all wise gals and all wise guys who basically <laughs> have discovered this dimension who report that they're happy, they're more loving, compassionate, they're motivated to live life, 
and they have a different relationship to pain and suffering, and they have a relief of a certain kind of suffering, uh, which allows them not to escape life. So the idea in awakening, as I define it, is not to transcend human condition, but to be more fully human. And that seems to just hinge upon uh, moving from kind of a small mind to a larger mind and a small sense of self to no self to a larger sense of self. Mm. <laughs> yes. And so in some ways it's, it's almost, it's not intellectual and it's not um, philosophical or theological or requires any belief. It's almost more uh, <clears throat> um, of a palpable figure ground shift of awareness so that what's in the foreground is now a lot of fast moving thoughts and strong emotions that are being organized by a small habit of consciousness and then awakening the background of this vast loving presence comes forward and then the contents of consciousness are just held and included but there's so much more capacity and space and dimensionality um, that allows for, you know, all the beautiful descriptions you've heard from, from people who write the poetry about it. Mm -hmm. But but part of the issue is that they they write a poetry about it and then they just tell you to do the first couple practices uh, they, and they forget to fill in the whole gap. So <laughs> how do you do it? So that's, that's been right. my, my interest is to kind of bring kind of learning theory, you know, more uh, democratic uh, interest in what's going on, finding and talking to all these different uh, teachers, reading all these manuals, practicing, looking, and having awareness start to show itself to itself, and then check it out with students, check it out with other people to really see if it's real, what's true, what's real, what's elegantly simple, and the report is that we can talk further about it, but it seems awakening that relieves suffering and brings a sense of these natural positive qualities is accessible, learnable, teachable, and available as a natural capacity, but it takes some unique ways of uh, learning and unlearning. Yeah, I know that it's one of the things we loved about your work so exactly. much. And we even use the word democratizing awakening. <laughs> it, you know, you're one of the few teachers I've read who aren't just pointing to awakening as something that happens by grace. Right. And as someone who's been in the field of psychology, transpersonal psychology specifically for a very long time, and as two practitioners speaking for Brooke and myself, it's been very evident how I've um, shifted as I've understood my conditioning, as I've meditated, as I've had different experiences. So to me, it's very clear that there's a gradual awakening that happens. And yeah. maybe not all of it is under our conscious control as we right. know it. Yeah. But there is something we can do to get involved. And we love that about how you present this. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's so important. That And one of the unique things is that there's there's preparation that can be done from our current sense of efforting, but then part of the system that I kind of uh, found is that actually the already awake awareness can begin to intentionally know itself. Mm -hmm. Because when you are awakened, you know, you, you kind of cross the threshold of initial awakening, you realize, oh, the doer is not doing it, but there's doing happening, and yet it's not, you haven't become a puppet of the divine, it, that, you know, there's no, which some people say, as a stage, as if, you know, there's no one here named Locke, and choices are just being made, and, you know, and it's like, yeah, kind of, I can see it a little bit, but then the personality comes on board, and there's a intelligent heart mind that really um, wants to be known and nurtured and um, wants to actually be the leader. Mm. 
Yeah, it's funny because we have so all these traditions, religions, lineages, and it's held up as this like rare, special. I mean, this is uh, everyone else's. All of our ego minds turn it into that, right? I'm not saying that's that that's right. what the teachers were trying to convey. I don't, Some certainly, of them do, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you talk yeah. about it as this very normal developmental. Yeah potential or stage for human beings, which I think just demystifies um, so much of it and just makes it so much more accessible. Yeah, I mean, I feel like more people can awaken than learn how to create microchips. <laughs> That's <a> great news. <laughs> I, don't know if I, I cannot figure out microchips. <laughs> yes, I can't. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, look at what humans are doing. They're doing all these other things. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the minds are busy with really complicated yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are talents, but this is kind of a almost a developmental stage. And it does, you know, I'll just say that um, I do agree with uh, Ken Wilber's um, premise that to stabilize awakening, it's not just a- awakening from an ego, that there's, an, uh, there's a waking up, there's a growing up, there's a cleaning up, and there's a showing up mm-hmm. that helps to stabilize and actually allow you to um, live from this, mm-hmm. that you can yeah. awaken and be immature and act out, which we've seen a lot of people who have, you know, initial authentic awakening. So it's not enough to just wake up from. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're yeah. with you. It's been yeah. interesting having the opportunity to meet so many people, so many teachers who've had um, awakened or awakening processes mm-hmm. because I realized, oh, my God, you have personalities. Yeah. Oh my God, you still have sometimes a blind spot here or there, you know, as you would point to a subpersonality or whatever someone calls it, a pain body. That's completely refreshing. I mean, I'm 44. I've been practicing Buddhism and studying these things since I was a teenager. Yeah. How am I just understanding that people still have personalities? They still have blind spots. They still have unprocessed pain that can live in their system. And I think it's so important that we speak about that one. So we understand our own journey more, right? We understand what the unfolding can be like, but two, so that when we're sitting with teachers, we recognize they're still humans and we don't uh, deify them That's right. and create a guru that we then follow blindly. Yeah. So it's really interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, you know that recent what was the name of that recent series on TV of of um, oh, the, oh, the one of Osho? Show? yes yeah <laughs> so you oh, can really God. see see so the uh, you know almost like a childlike dependency that people go into and then go into kind of a bliss ninny stage <laughs> <but> me- <laughs> meanwhile meanwhile everyone else in the you know in the politicals are just doing the normal political things in turning including like having guns and, you know, mm-hmm. you know, Great. willing to, you know, kill each other or, and all sorts of crazy things. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, but there are models. And I think this is kind of one of the <clears throat> democratic um, curiosities is to see that there are sometimes extreme models that have said, um, you know, that awakening is going beyond all emotions mm-hmm. or awakening is just pure awareness. It's, uh, transcending humanity and becoming awake. <clears throat> Enlightened means you have no, uh, no normal human emotions or, mm. and, and I don't see that. I mean, if you all have to look as, look at the Dalai Lama, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, and that's kind of more of what awakening looks like. It's a <clears throat> happy, joyous, but, you know, somebody who I saw who heard his friend had died in the Chinese prison and start crying, you know, on stage. So um, there's a, a fullness and a richness um, and an energy <clears throat> to the awakened life that has, um, that's really about a kind of a stage of development that goes up. It doesn't go like backwards or um, <clears throat> out of the human realm. Mm-hmm. I also found it relieving that you don't speak about ego death the way sometimes other teachers do, which I found personally, I think I have some fear systems around death. And so 
I started to find this very natural thing scary because my mind was holding on to the concept of I don't want to die and I don't want to lose my personality and all of these different things. Um, so instead you speak about shifting identity and I wanted to take a moment and just read a yeah. little something from your sure. book to share with the audience. Okay. So one of my favorite chapters, and I think Brooke also had a great appreciation for this because she pulled some we quotes quoted too. heavily from this chapter <laughs> was, <laughs> was location, location, location. Sure. Yeah. Also being a New Yorker, I get the real estate <laughs> thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, um, you wrote, In the open-hearted awareness approach to awakening and growing up, the simplest way to answer all questions about how to relieve the root of suffering is the same. Shift. Anytime you mistake a self-image, an emotion, or a belief for who you are, you need to shift and relocate your identity. You're not just shifting out of the problem. You're shifting into that which sees the situation differently. Once you shift, the answer will come from within you. In the simplest sense, we are shifting into a new awareness-based operating system. Mm -hmm. The first step is to shift out of ego identification and our current level of everyday mind. So Brooke and I also sometimes use the language um, different dimension of reality. Mm -hmm. You're talking about different levels of consciousness. Yes. It's very fundamental to your work. And quite frankly, it's been very fundamental, I think, for both of us, because as I've shifted into different levels of consciousness, I can understand teachings I didn't really get before. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I wondered if we could keep clarifying what you started in the first question, which is what is the mini me or ego identity? And what does it mean to shift into a different operating system that's awareness based? Yeah, so why don't I say a little about it, and then maybe we can do a little glimpse practice to awesome. see what people feel about it. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the thing, is that we're so identified, and even our, you know, great intellectual philosophical traditions and psychological traditions and educational traditions still operate within the cloud of this mostly conceptual mind and even... Uh, Most people still believe, you know, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. So that, so that's kind of a few, you know, a hundred years ago, that, that uh, saying, it's still pretty much what most people think. And thinking has become faster and better. And, and the kinds of learning related to thinking uh, has been refined. And so even this sense that there's a non-conceptual awareness that's more intelligent than thinking and more primary is like, wait a minute, I know, I, are you telling me just to be silent? You know, just like silence. Oh, I like silence. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. like, <laughs> I'll quiet and then my ego will feel calm. But, mm-hmm. but it's literally a different level of mind that when you leave the gap of thought based knowing to not knowing, which is kind of a Zen movement of letting go, then you have that peace of mind or silence or relief. Like being aware of space with no content. But then the curious thing is, is the awareness aware of space or what's it like if the space is actually aware and you're aware from space? Mm -hmm back to thought, feeling, and sensation. So there's a larger sense of where you're aware from or who's aware, and you're not going from thought to thought to know. You're not orienting by thought. You start to orient by something that's kind of not on the psychological map, which is called nature of mind or turiya in in Hinduism it's awake space or nature of mind or spacious awareness um, and it's prior to thinking and it's also the wisdom mind that's beyond thought that can use thought as a tool so it's really like this is like the key 
thing that seems to be um, so new and initially very difficult because we're trying to know this with our minds. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And we're trying to Done just that. let go or just sit there and hope it comes up. Mm-hmm. And we get some relief. We usually get, like a lot of people in meditation will get to the stress management dimension of uh, not knowing. So there's some quiet silence, but as if they're qualities that you're aware of or that you're feeling, but the question is, is this peace of mind what you're aware of, or is the peace of mind who you are, Mm. to which thoughts and states, emotions are appearing? So that's the figure ground shift that initially people just get a glimpse of. Like some people listening may just kind of get a glimpse of that and then as soon as you go back to check with the mind, did I really have that? <laughs> then you're out of it. <laughs> right. So, so that's the thing is that there's a not knowing and then a not knowing that knows. And the stabilizing of awakening is the awareness based knowing is embodied and open hearted and refers to itself and then uses thought as needed. So it's kind of like a continuous intuition or um, a flow state or being in the zone, which people may have experienced um, in, you know, sports or music or other activities where you're optimally functioning. You don't have to be quiet and withdrawn or in a quiet place. You can even be in New York City and you can be on a subway and it's all the the presence is palpable um, because it's it, there's been a little shift of where you're aware from, which is the location, what's aware, and what are information and perception and experience appearing to. They don't a- appear to the thinker that thinks about thought to put it in a category. So literally the screen of your mind is quiet, but you're in kind of the knowing that a Tai Chi master goes into and trains to be in, which means you could respond if you needed to at any moment, both verbally and physically if you needed to. And there's a sense of safety, Mm -hmm. okayness or well-being. Um, So this... So this can be trained. So that, those are the qualities. So you know, you kind of know what, what the, the kind of state, states are, what the stages are, what the traits are, what the, and where you can go off a little bit. And then you start to feel almost like you're fine tuning your own instrument a little bit and navigating. But what's navigating is the awareness itself. Mm. So that requires this, this first two is realizing that non-local awareness is what's aware. And then from non-local spacious awake awareness, the local awareness is what focuses inside, outside. You're no longer using attention, which actually is overtrained in most meditation systems. And the more you learn to meditate, the more you've created obstacles to the next stage of meditation. <laughs> of, of awakening because you're getting too good at the system that isn't operating when you're awake. Mm. That's really interesting. That's super helpful to point out that like the way that a certain <clears throat> kind of meditation can kind of ho- hold you in place. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hold yeah. You in. yeah. And it's not that, you know, it's bad. It's, it's a preliminary, but it's meant to be a preliminary practice. Yeah. Just to calm, calm the mind, soothe the animal. Mm-hmm. You know, just, you know, soothe the animal body and, and get a sense of the, the energy that's not overwhelming, the physical energy, the emotional energy, and the interconnected energy, which we can talk about a little bit later because that becomes a big part of it. But so it's really <clears throat> the premise is that 
if you do it gradually, you know, there's studies now, uh, Willoughby Britain uh, from Brown University has done studies about um, the uh, the dangers of actually deconstructing during meditation for people who are beginners. Because if you go gradually, I think it's more dangerous to do gradual than direct practice. Mm, because interesting. You actually deconstruct the ego and you deconstruct the ego defenses. And if you don't even have it on your map that you're looking for the new operating system, you're left in the gap. Mm-hmm. I actually so, had that happen I, when I'm I like, did Shambhala <laughs> meditation. <laughs> yeah, and I sat for a long time yes. and felt like, I just kept saying, I feel like I'm falling apart. I feel like I'm falling apart. And yeah. finally, I just had to stop meditating for a while. It, that's that's a fairly common experience. And I unfortunately, I think it's part of the gradual path that doesn't give a map or stays too long in the in the absence mm-hmm. without and hope, hoping the presence will show up. But it doesn't often uh, unless you know how to know it. Yeah. And so, so when you say... Way, yeah. Direct practice, you mean knowing how to know it, knowing how to know awake That's awareness right. specifically. Yes. Is that, yeah. And how, rather than deconstructing, rather than, you know, usual path is calming through one point of attention, calming the mind, focusing, and then uh, observing contents until you realize, oh, I'm not my thoughts, I'm not my feelings, I'm not, and then the, 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 the egoic point of view is gone, the ego defenses are gone, and then you get can get flooded by uh, unconscious material that was kept in. Whereas if the this method of going, having awareness go out of the cloud into the space that's awake and then feel like the awake space is the new operating system that's embodied, that's made of awareness energy, and the awareness energy is able to see and feel all the parts and all the emotions immediately. Say, well, come and... And the way it feels them is through a kind of a natural love and connection, not from a detached observer. So that position is what often is almost a depersonalization movement that can, you know, rather than this kind of embracing awareness, um, that is the natural condition. So awakening doesn't feel like a sky. It literally feels more like uh, everything is connected. Mm-hmm. So emptiness, that's kind of what the word emptiness means, interconnected. Mm. It doesn't mean what we, what we think it means in the West. Mm. It, it means it's empty of separate, of a separate, of separate selves. So empty of separate selves means interconnected. <sighs> Which is a lot different than lost in space. And lost in space, which is... And it doesn't exactly imply no self. That's right. It doesn't imply no self. Which is very relieving. I mean, recently, um, I think if I put it on your model, I had a waking in experience. And I've sort of been there for a while. Um, My stories of unlovable, none of that is convincing. I can't seem to make myself a problem. All of these things, because I had quite a bit of fear around awakening. I've been on this path a long time, really afraid of what it would be like if I let go. And in some ways, because of all the concepts that were coming into my mind and how my mind was holding on to them, your ego is going to die. There's no self. Will I lose my husband then? What will happen to my life? Right. So there was always this sense of every time something started to shift, I would almost experience myself tensing right at that point, like gripping. And what's interesting is it feels extremely good not to be identified with the problem making kind of mini me feels extremely relieving. That's right. Yet I had so much fear about that shift. I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of, I'll do a little, you know, there's different models. And so you kind of have to, say that everyone is kind of allowed to have their own view of it. Sure. But, but even, uh, you know, the, you know, in, in the Tibetan Buddhist, they talk about the three turnings of the wheel. The first turning of the wheel is, uh, anatta is, is the, the emptiness of, of self. There's no, there's not a self, but even then, uh, Buddha would never answer that question. Is there a self or is there not a self? <laughs> 
and ultimately said there is an unborn and uncreated uh, and unbecome. If there weren't, there would be no uh, liberation. So it's not as if there's a, there's nothing, nothing. Um, and then the the sense of there not being a self, it, there's not a self, there's just these five uh, dimensions, five skandhas, five heaps of thought, feeling, sensation, and there's they're appearing, they're real, but there's not anyone who's the driver of the chariot. Then the next one is the Heart Sutra, which kind of said, oh, wait a minute, even the five heart, even the five heaps are empty. There's nothing there. They're not solid either. And then the third turning of the wheel said, yeah, and what's here when they're not here is this awake consciousness which has positive qualities. Mm. So there's not a separate self. There's a, <clears throat> comes back to almost more of a, a, a larger self that then has a conventional self or an ego function or a personality that's part of its uh, vehicle. Mm. So the sense that, you know, you're not getting rid of the ego, you're just realizing that there, the ego function has been trying to be an ego identity. Mm-hmm. And the ego function can be, is very helpful and useful to remember your phone number <laughs> and uh, <laughs> drive a car and things like that. And it's part of the human relative reality and conventional reality. Um, you know, when you say, and someone said, hey, Buddha, you know, he turned around, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> One presumes. <laughs> you, you think, I don't know. It wasn't in the text, though, but just kind of right. assuming assume. that was, that seems, re- <laughs> seems reasonable because mm-hmm. he was talking and walking. But anyhow, it's, um, so, <clears throat> So it's this all, it's kind of this all at onceness that includes, uh, the ocean of awareness that's appearing as, as, as our unique waves of our personality and our, uh, personhood and our humanity that has a dance, there's a dance going on, uh, and a recognition and a, a realm of human, precious human birth. Mm. So that has, you know, relative personality and, people and relationships and all that's good. It's really only this, like, who's the center? Like, what, do you, what, that's the suffering that, that can be removed and shifted is who's driving the vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, is it the small self? Is it the no self? Or is it the larger self? You know, and then you have a self driving vehicle, right? Mm-hmm. Which is good without fear. So then, so that feeling, then can embrace all the parts of you that are traumatized parts. So instead of what you went through by deconstructing the sense of self and then hanging out in the gap and getting flooded, you go, you go right to the solution and right to the upgrade of the operating system of the loving, uh, open hearted awareness that is interconnected with everyone that isn't taking on other people's energies because it kind of just moves right through you and it's all, there's such a bigger feeling of capacity and um, openness and support. And then there's a feeling of safety, well-being, and um, and then like a flow state, optimal functioning. You start to be able to talk and walk actually better and less stress and less worry and less fear from the small sense of self. So it's this secondary self that's the no self. It's not the personality or the or the ego function or your your body mind. It's it's this this no self is not the self. And when people have that initial awakening, because they think that's who they are, they think, oh, this is Locke. This is what Locke. Oh, I'm not Locke. There is no Locke. But no, that wasn't Locke in the beginning. That was that was, <laughs> that was the one. That was the one who thought it was Locke. Right. Yeah. Locke is still here. Uh, there's still, you know, there is a Loch Ness. There's Loch Ness. <laughs> not, not a myth. But, not a myth. But it's not a. It's not a actual running the show. So, so this feeling of this co-opting 
which happens at like uh, one and a half to three years old, what develops in a child is what's called self interesting self-awareness is the psychological term, not the spiritual term. So self-awareness means a child looks in a mirror um, and can't and doesn't know it's them, but one and a half, you put a mark on their cheek, and now they, they look in the mirror and they, they go like this. So they start to know, oh, that's me, oh, I have a name, oh, and then they start to create an inner uh, parent or voice that says, uh, you shouldn't touch the stove, it might be hot. So that internalized, and so who's the you it's talking to? Who's talking and who's the you? So it splits off this, you know, kind of um, baby that is in kind of, you know, primary process thinking, and then secondary process creates uh, a thinker or a mini-me system that starts thinking it's you, and then it tries to solve the problem of identity and satisfaction as if it's a body, but there's no body. Mm. So that problem solver, if that problem solver can relax its job of identity, and then if the premise is that there's some other awareness here that's safe and open and you can be aware from that and be alert and responsive, not kind of dumbed down or spaced out, uh, then people might try that. We might try a short little uh, glimpse practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah. So it's very simple. This one is, and again, this one is good because it shows you how quick the shift can be. It shows you how close the other dimension of awareness is if it happens to work. You know, anybody may work for it, may not. It's, you know, each of the glimpses some people find helpful. Others, you know, they kind of doesn't work for it. It's not about the person who's listening, whether it's often about the match of glimpse rather than their capacity. Um, so just to let people know. But if you really kind of feel that there's almost this secondary self that's not you, that's, and it's not about, we're not getting rid of problems in the world. We're not saying there's no issues or stuff to deal with or personality or things in the world that are problems. But what I'm going to ask is, what is it like if there's no problem to solve on the level of identity? So just that problem solver that's looking for, who am I? What's going on? So we're all sitting comfortably and there's no tigers in the room. So this is good. <laughs> so we know... No, that problem is not a problem. So this is about the feeling of what's here when the problem solver relaxes. So just simply understand this inquiry and then kind of say it to yourself, but then look with awareness and feel kind of back and down and out and into the field of what's aware of everything. So just by asking yourself this simple inquiry, what's here now when there's no problem to solve? This is one of my very can, favorite pointers of yours. I love it every time. It's so helpful. It's like yeah. whoosh, instantly. You know? yeah. So you can, for those who are listening at home, you can either close your eyes or open, but you want to feel like when you hear the words, what's here now and there's no problem solved, and then just relax the problem solver and let awareness feel the dimension of awareness that is aware of thoughts, feelings, sensations, and where are you aware from if you're not aware from that point of view? And just feel what's absent, what's changed and let go of. And then let awareness notice any new qualities any dimensionality, spacious, open, 
relief, peace, quiet, silence. And the feeling of being rather than thinking or doing. And just not going up to thought to orient and not going down to sleep to rest. Just let awareness know itself and everything else from awareness. So we probably could do the whole pod- podcast like this. <laughs> I kind of want to now. <laughs> Why talk about anything else now? <laughs> so, you know, just to say to people that even if you're like one second, two seconds, three seconds, like that's a full glimpse. Like just the unhooking, just the letting go, the dropping, the relief, the relaxing of the efforting or the doing and then the discovery of some qualities and then a new feeling of knowing or alertness that's not orienting by thought is really curious that it's here no matter it's not it's not dependent on conditions Mm -hmm. like a quiet place or a right yeah, and Vanessa and I make a great team in many ways, and one of them is that we're structured fairly differently in terms of ego stuff. So Vanessa is an avoid-the-void person, fear of death, holds on more. I am a lost-in-space, <laughs> <laughs> fall into the gap, yeah. and I am the sock puppet for God, and I don't exist anymore. You know, So I've spent some time on emptiness bed rest, as I call it, which is a pretty uncomfortable place to be, actually or whatever it is. I don't know. It's a nowhere place to be. But, you know, so I just want to underscore because the practice you just took us through, for those who are structured more like me, you didn't take us to a, to nowheresville, you know, to, to I'm nothing. There's something there, you know, you're, you're held as you were describing before in, in this interconnected field, which can help for those of us who tend to you know, <laughs> I'm not a fear of life, a fear of death person. I'm the fear of life person. So it's like, eh, yeah. I can just yeah. <laughs> disappear <laughs> into the gap, right. yes, um, yes. which, you know, it doesn't feel good because it turns into like low functionality and all those things. So to be able to connect with that sense of there is something here larger than me, I'm held within something yeah. is so helpful. And, and yet you you probably feel also that that space that's awake, but now it's awake and energetic. Right. So yes. it's still primary. It's just not, um, it's not only that. It's not either this or that. Right. It's, it's the both and, but the awake is the, is dynamic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's, the, that's kind of the, that's kind of the, <laughs> the, the, the full, the full thing, the full awakening mm-hmm. in a second to get a feel for what it's kind of like. And then the checking is to see. And then, but many people who go in will get, you know, what I call facets of the diamond of awakening. So some people will get more relaxed and peace. Some people get a little more love. Some people will get bliss. Some people will get, you know, creativity or, you know, and all those will come at different times. Uh, but it takes you into the unit, the unity or the non-separation that's equally inside and out. Mm. And that's equally awareness, energy, uh, interconnection, uh, freedom and embodiment. Mm. So those two wings, the Shakti and the Shiva, mm. you know, the Shiva silence and the Shakti dance. And not just one or the other. Um, <clears throat> that's the that's the real. That's what I feel is awakening to both those uh, feminine, masculine, Shakti, Shiva, dynamic stillness, uh, contemplation, and action. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I, I think it's beautiful. Judith Blackstone. Have you ever, are you aware? Yes, do you know, know. Judith? Yeah, yeah. We studied with Judith. We got okay. certified in her method and, and you and her both speak about, you know, recognizing the space inside of you and the space outside of you and yes. recognizing that they're one and the same, just using different language, yes. which can be at moments I find it incredibly relieving. Yes. And I've had moments in the past where I felt Oh God, I have no boundaries to begin with. I'm one of those energetic, sensitive people. You're more energetic. Absorbing yeah, everything, yeah. right? I don't even know how that works, but feels like you're yeah. absorbing everything. Yeah. And so almost at the point of recognizing oneness, I go, Oh no. Right. Right. Merging. I don't know what it is. It's just an yeah. oh no. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Do people ever describe that to you? You work with oh, so yeah. many clients over the years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very similar in both of you describing those. And some of it I find is is to kind of get a good a good enough map that really shows you the detours and the and the eddies. And those are the detours and the eddies. The the more uh too spaced out or too uh you know, afraid of afraid of life, afraid of death, uh too too subtle and then too afraid of the energy. But it's when the awareness and energy mix, you're not going back to what's called subtle mind and body, which are the meditative or the living from an ego that is dealing with energy. You're in the ground that energy is, <clears throat> there's no place for it to hurt. Right. So you, you really feel like an ocean. There's so much more yeah. depth uh, and stillness to the, to the energy. And even somebody whose energy is strong, you walk into a room, and you know, it feels like it's kind of just, you know, the, the, the capacity of the vastness is just kind of, you know, kind of eating it for lunch. You know, it's kind of like going, oh, you know, like this is a little effervescent tickle, you know. Like, <laughs> Sounds because, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when I first started meditating with Judith and she was taking us through her fundamental consciousness yep. practices, what I was doing was experiencing energy, not what you would call awake awareness or she would That's call right. fundamental consciousness. I I didn't yet have the pointer to recognize the the subtlety right. of the other experience. And in your book, you spoke about uh, matter, energy, space, yeah. as well as this non-dual awareness as ground of beings. And, you know, it's very obvious we can identify with our thoughts. Yeah. We can identify with our physical body. Yeah. Can people identify as energy? It seems Absolutely. like I've been observing that. Yes, that is a big uh, category mm -hmm. that's very important to recognize that people tend to be more mental or more energetic emotional types mm -hmm. you can be mental emotional or energetic emotional or or energy or more mental uh and there's there's one thing that needs to be recognized is that's not also not on the map is there's a there's a uh a way that human beings actually perceive energy in the field of the room or the space that that's a that's not that's one of the senses Mm. Right. Yeah. So, so people just you have to, you know, like that helps people so much to realize, no, that's real. Right. You're yeah. not, you know, then you could be projecting too. That's another thing that mixes with it. You could be projecting your fear. Oh, it feels like that person's afraid. Okay. That can happen. But the other person can be afraid and you're not afraid and you know they're smiling and they're afraid. Mm -hmm. They're like, there's nothing wrong. Everything's fine. I'm completely confident. And you're going like, oh, my God, you know, yeah. you're literally. So that's called subtle body perception. Mm -hmm. OK, that is <clears throat> is a dimension of what of, of our being that some people are more sensitive to. And then subtle mind is kind of meditative mind, subtle mind. So everyday mind is this cloud, which is more mental, emotional, functional, creates managers in the system. But then everyone's got protectors and uh hurt parts that are traumatized and hurt um and then the managing system though uh 
tends to be what's called everyday mind or ego mind. Uh, and then there's subtle mind, which is ability to go into an observing, non-judgmental awareness. And then there's subtle body, which is if you just drop and go, oh, you know, you're out of subtle, you're out of everyday mind, but now you've opened up this door of uh, energy, mm. energy sensitivity. And certainly people who are um, highly sensitive, emotional people, are people who have this, you know, strong sense, just like somebody has good eyesight or good hearing. That's just, it's one of the senses, I think. Mm. In Buddhism, thinking is considered the sixth sense. So that's important for mental types, that that's a sense, it's an organizing sense, but who is it appearing to? Who are the senses appearing to? They're appearing to awareness. Mm. And so energy is appearing to awareness. So we move on kind of a map from everyday mind to subtle body, subtle mind, and then <clears throat> getting this feeling of awake awareness as the knowing, non-conceptual, perceiving that can perceive energy without getting identified, mm. can perceive thoughts, parts of ourselves that isn't leaving. Uh, so pure awareness is aware of itself. As soon as pure awareness is aware of anything, it's awareness energy. Mm. So even the non-dual people who say, oh, I'm just pure awareness and everything is uh, clouds and birds moving through, that's a meditative state. Mm. That's... the you're no longer in, you're in a witness consciousness. As soon as awareness perceives anything, it's, 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 it's connected to it. It knows it by being it. Yeah. It's in, it's inherent within it. So, but then if awareness is 51% the reality, you can't get, you won't get overwhelmed by any energy that happens. As soon as mental energy or emotional energy, or, you know, more psychic energy is primary, then it'll take you for a ride. Mm. Hell yeah. <laughs> and like when you're aware of energy, I mean, there's so much aliveness in your body and energy yes. moves. A lot. You almost right. feel like you're a reed in the ocean, you know. Yes. And then a lot of people I know who deal with this, and of course, Brooke and I have experienced this in different ways, they go into the manager role. That's but right. then that manager is exhausting. The man because manager cannot handle it. Yeah. They cannot handle it. Yeah. And, and yeah. you start to exhaust yourself trying not to be around that person, trying not to read the news, trying, That's you right. know. Yeah. So you're either going to go into repression, which leads to depression, <laughs> or you're going to go into anxiety by trying to manage it and letting it, letting yourself feel it. Mm -hmm. So anxiety and depression are the symptoms of too small an operating system mm -hmm. and being a sensitive human being. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of the, what else you're going to do. You're going to be neurotic or and anxious, or you're going to be depressed and shut down or in some role. Yes, hello everyone. I'm <laughs> I'm very spiritual. I'm a meditation teacher. Hello, yes, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> or if you meet if you're me, you'll alternate. Yeah, anxious. you all do that. Yeah. I know. Different I'm managers. listening. I'm like done all of the things. Yeah. <laughs> done all the, so you have different <laughs> different parts will take over. So so the awakening back to the original question is literally that there is a a non non part based non sub personality non ego function that is the primary dimension of who you are mm. that feels big. Literally, it feels both vast or spacious or open that's the first quality and then it's knowing from the openness rather than thought and then it's embracing or supportive so that now it has awareness and interconnection without identifying or feeling overwhelmed those are the so that transition from awareness-based knowing if you're in thought-based knowing you know, you're, you're, it's too small for the, the amount of energy that a human being has because we're so, we're, we are interconnected with everything already. Mm. So it, it really takes that, um, that, uh, upgrading to that system of, uh, 
of open heartedness ultimately, which is the has love and compassion um, to be able to feel um, what is um, you know what is like one mind. It feels like everything is in your mind. Everything's in you know all connected, and it's just your mind isn't here anymore. It's like everywhere. And everyone that you're connected to everyone, like I'm right now, feel like we're in the same place. Mm-hmm. We're right here in the same place. Right. We're in the same mind. We're not, you know, distant. And that's the feeling. And it's safe. Mm-hmm. So it's it's that weird transition that's the hard part. That's right. Yes. It's, <laughs> it is. It's, and so how to, in some ways, the system I do is is quickly going and only staying like three seconds to three minutes in the pure awareness but just to unplug from everything. Mm. And then as the awareness, it's immediately awareness energy. Oh, but now it stays primarily and now it comes back and you're now realizing, okay, I'm going to meet emotions, parts, and thoughts. So stay open and loving and big and here they come. Ready? Here they are. (laughs) (laughs) And now they're, and now, but you're like, and now they're like, but I'm, but I need to talk to you. And I need to, like, okay, I hear you. And you stay embracing and aware from the awareness, energy, open heartedness so that they can't collapse you. Mm. Cause really that's the thing is that you have these experiences or glimpses. And what takes us back is the habit of becoming small and collapsed around either a strong emotional traumatic part or a manager part that feels like, well, we got to be safe. Mm-hmm. You know, well, that was nice, but what are you going to do? You know, we got to go somewhere now, you know, and it grabs you and, and then you really, you have to realize that the feeling of that and then learn to return, uh, re-recognize and, and then come back and embrace that part, not get rid of it, not deny it, not belittle it, that even the protective parts, the angry parts, the terrorized parts, the hateful parts, they're not bad. Mm-hmm. Right. They're literally when they're when you meet them in their rage, they're like, I'm trying to protect you from the other rageful people. Are, aren't I supposed to match their energy? You know, like, well, we may not need that now. <laughs> you know, what would you do if you if you didn't have to do that right now? Mm. It's like, really? There's an option? You know, like, yeah. <laughs> Right now, maybe when you're a child, you know, mm. not so much. But right now, you, you know, how about that? Like, oh, wow, I would, like, go have some fun. Or something. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. They yeah, literally so are, innocent. <laughs> are these loving, compassionate warriors. Mm-hmm. And, you're, and we're trying to spiritualize them away. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, with a, and that, you know, as right? we round out the the conversation we've had a chance to have with you, it, it gets to the, like, what is what is the point, you know, because we think that it's this idea of becoming the spiritual person or some other persona because right. we're doing it from the smaller self. But all the pointers you've just given that it's just it's too small an operating system to live in without missing our lives in a certain way. Like we can't really be in them. You know, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the little spiritual Ego can't grow up to be awakened. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta, so that is the part about no self. That's the, just that little identity can't, has to realize, oh, I'm a part of something greater. Oh, now I'm still part of it. Mm-hmm. So it's not dying. You're not killing it. You're not fighting it, but you're not letting the kid drive the car, you know? <laughs> Right. right. It's just a bad idea. Right. What's, a, what's amazing about speaking about it as a shift and, yeah. and speaking about it as an operating system yeah. is for many years, I've had wonderful spiritual concepts and I've had glimpses and tastes things like compassion, compassion for others and self or forgiveness, or even because I went to school for transpersonal psychology, meeting yourself with non-resistance and even with love. And I've always gotten there to some degree glimpses. Yeah. But so often you're just coming at it from concept and then you're trying to make yourself meet yourself, but from ego identity. Exactly. 
Yeah. And you just can't soften. You just can't. Yeah. And then you're mad that you can't soften. And now you're judging yourself and, That's right. and all those things. <laughs> right. And when you realize, okay, this is just part of how the brain structure works. It's part of yeah. how the nervous system That's works, right. that a shift needs to happen into what can actually feel safe, which That's is it. this larger experience of awareness. And that once you shift there, everything is held, seen, felt, heard and experienced differently. That's it. Then if there is in fact a problem, you have a whole new operating system to solve it from that's not projecting the past <clears throat> onto your present or future, which that's is game changing because we're all right. just operating from past models over and over again in innocence, but man it hurts. Yeah. So let's 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 you let's the three of us in our audience like the, exactly what you said is really in terms of the model and the teaching and the movement from understanding to the shift. It's like, what is all this? You can learn so much and then you try to develop a self that has compassion for the self. <laughs> Which self is having compassion for the right. self? I don't know. I can try. Well, this self and now this other self says, what are you having compassion for that self for? Cause I'm like, I need a little compassion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, and, then, the whole and the division goes on <laughs> and then and then the the but it's all being done by the parts mm. within the cloud and so but but when the concept of like what you just said which was said with words is like yeah but you just realize that if you shift out of the cloud into this there's already this dimension that's already loving and and has all the things i've been searching for well, okay, now where's the gap here? Like what? Like that wasn't that hard to understand. Mm -mm. But you know, that's pretty. Like that's the linchpin to this whole thing, mm. right? But what? It's like, but the little mini me's don't want to remember that. They still, they still want to like, yeah, but. We haven't tried all the things that I, I <laughs> yeah, learned. They, just, <laughs> they want to do like a good job. They want like to picture a job. lot more ideas. Do a good still. Job. <laughs> yeah, I got some more ideas to do, and we can. We can really, so it's that it's that forgetting, which is really the unawakening. Mm. Back, you drop into the awareness that's already loving and awake, and it's loving you, and then you get caught and triggered, and then you can't remember from there that view of that whatever part of that system that's sitting in the seat of self is going like, oh, yeah, that's right. Remember what you did before? Well, what did you do before? Well, you shifted out of Well, yeah, shifted out of that, but that's not that easy to do. You can't just do that all the time. You know, you're going to end up, remember, you might end up, you know, you know, being afraid of death or you could be a couch potato. So, mm -hmm. you know, we can't, do, you know, like all of a sudden it's like, so, yes. like, so like the, <laughs> the thing you read is the answer to all the problems it's like the people raise their hand. Well, what about this? What about that? The answer to all the problems is shift. Mm -hmm. In other words, that's all, that's all you have to remember is like, oh, I'm identified or attached with a part. Oh, that causes suffering. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's an option. There's another option. What is it? Is it really complex? Like a theory of, or do I need to read a book about it? No, you know, <laughs> yeah. just, just let awareness open. And find that which is already aware and loving and embrace everything. So literally, I mean, it's just feel like you're identified. I mean, everyone can do this kind of just feel like you're identified with that part and you're thinking about thinking and then see what it's like if awareness just opens to space. And then the key is you can't just that's not enough. You have to see, okay, now I'm aware of space, so I'm out, but now I'm aware from space. Is space aware? And that takes a little, you can't think about it, you have to feel it. Mm -hmm. So then you feel from space back. So why don't we do a, you want to do a, a, a little glimpse practice? Yes, I think so. Great. Yes. Group? Yeah. So this one will, uh, so what I'll do is uh, we'll do one that's visual. So uh, med a lot of meditations are done with eyes closed, but ultimately you want to get the whole system on board. Otherwise, you have eyes closed. As soon as you get up off the cushion, you're going to be triggered back, micro-triggered back into associations that lead you to the old habit. 
So sometimes I call this returning the eyes to their natural state. Um, <clears throat> so this way is the door of the eyes. Um, so we'll just do a short version of it. So basically uh, what we'll do is um, simply allow uh, awareness to move around uh, not only to the sides, but literally feel as if somehow awareness can move and become aware of the space behind you uh, so that you have this open panoramic view. Mm. But what we'll do is we'll start with our eyes kind of resting. And one way to feel that awareness is moving is to start to feel your peripheral vision starts to open. So when your peripheral vision is open, your eyes are not actually moving. They're, but your awareness from your grasping mind is keeping you pinpointed to look for danger. And when you, people who drive actually, in order to drive well, to do one of the activities that we do that's, you know, perhaps the most dangerous, uh, driving a one ton vehicle, you know, on a road with other one ton vehicles at 60 miles an hour while people are texting is, <laughs> is, is you, you drive best and you enjoy driving if you're in this open panoramic, uh, flow state. So what we're going to do is literally have the brain follow awareness, uh, around and then open our view and then have a feeling from our open view that the awareness includes our body and is interconnected and we'll see how that that works so just kind of describing it so i don't surprise people but it's a fairly simple uh way of opening it can kind of a form of sky gazing uh so just looking relaxed and receiving light and feeling like you kind of look straight ahead or a little bit up and then Gently start to open your peripheral vision slowly without strain, equally left and right at the same time. So just no rush, but just start to feel awareness is opening. And as awareness opens, your vision opens, and you start to feel a more spacious view. And you can actually breathe in cool air and smile. And then allow awareness at some time to begin to come to the sides of your body. And as it does, awareness can kind of let go of seeing and begin to be aware of the space on the sides in which sound is coming and going. And then somehow, without quite knowing how it's happening, awareness can feel and move by itself. So it continues around to be aware of the space behind you in which sound is coming and going. So you feel somehow the absence of anything and a feeling of Space, almost as if awareness has your back. So just feel this open view above you, below you, within you, all around you, to the sides, in front, behind. And just enjoy, again, breathing in, smiling. Feel this open view. And be aware of the space and the awareness that's open. And then curious, are you aware of the spacious awareness? Or what's it like when you're aware from the spacious awareness? Does it feel like if the space was aware of itself? From outside at first? Just so you kind of unplugged from thought, and yet you're alert, and you've unplugged from orienting even to your senses for just a moment. 
but that there's this alert, clear, timeless, boundless, open intelligence that's aware of space within and all around. And then just notice that as this space, you can be aware now back toward your body. And as this awareness begins to be curious, notice that the awareness is feeling the energy of sound, the energy of the aliveness in the room. And then this awareness, which remains the primary aware of knowing, begins to feel the awareness and energy within your body. So there's a feeling of a spacious and pervasive alert awareness that feels silent, still, clear, open, but is equally inside and out. Is aware of what's moving inside, of what's moving outside. And it feels as if you can breathe in and let out a sigh. Ah, Equally outside and in. And then let the awareness just scan through your body, the field of your body, like an ocean of awareness that's arising as this wave of aliveness. And see whether it needs to have a manager centered in your body. And upon not finding one or needing one, just allow this awareness to be aware from everywhere, of everything, and able to respond as needed, just like you're driving. So just feeling a sense of having dropped from head to heart mind. So you feel a contact with this awake space and intelligence that's equally aware from your whole body, from top to bottom, and a feeling of interconnectedness with everything and every one. So the awareness is primary and the energy is dancing. And see whether you feel a kind of safety, okayness, well-being, ability to respond if you needed to, and just rest as this open-hearted awareness Just being, what's it like to be without orienting to thought? So just see what's here when there's nothing to do and nowhere to go. And kind of enjoying a kind of bliss or joy or love or just effervescence as one of the dimensions. While you can still be aware of things and body parts and emotions and parts of you that may be showing up, just feel like all sensations, thoughts, and emotions and parts of you are welcome from this embracing, open-hearted interconnectedness. And whatever's happening is fine, just feeling rather than thinking from this awarenessing. So just see what is the feeling of being like? What are the qualities that show up? What do you notice? Either of you two notice anything? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, that was a beautiful shift. Because it has that feeling again, I was talking about of um, being held in something much larger at first. And then the part that was really interesting for me was like it getting kind of coming through. You know, because right. I do the lost in space thing. <laughs> so the like reconnecting to the, the like, ah, energy. that feels good. You know? <laughs> and you don't have to be lost in space and then back in. Exactly. Like, you don't have back. to toggle between the two extremes, which of course, yeah. Yeah. In Tibetan Buddhism, they call it mixing practice. Mm. Being, you know, mixing space with awareness and then mixing awareness with energy. Mm-hmm. 
So it's mixing. You're not actually doing it, but you're noticing that they're mixed. Mm-hmm. And that's the and thing. There's, and there's something so profound about recognizing that movement and stillness happen at the same time, you know, your your breath and the quiet. That to me, when I get that pointer, is such a depthful one because it's pointing you towards aliveness, right? Like we are at the same time aware and still, and yet there's life, there's movement, there's energy, and both happen right at once. That's right. And they're not threatening. And what's changed is the is where you're aware from. Mm-hmm. You know, all the other dimensions are more present, but you're aware from a more spacious rather than small point of view. Right? Yeah. That's what it feels like. Mm-hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Large, like you're really quite large. Yeah. <laughs> quite. You know, like, like, uh, I think John Prendergast said this to us once, Brooke, but talking about how you feel like your body is being held within awareness, right? Like, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, instead of locating as this body, there's something larger in your body's held within. And I I heard it. And I thought, that sounds nice. And then months later, I went, Oh, (laughs) it is nice. (laughs) I understand what he's talking about. It's something much vaster. Mm. Yeah. And then you even feel like it's appearing, you know, as this awareness that it's made of awareness. It's not two things like awareness and then the body is in it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like an object in space. Uh-huh. Because that's, that's the energy dimension. That's the, oh, so the me. Shiva and Shakti. <laughs> so that you can both, so you can have that energy. You don't have to feel like the space allows you to be solid, but the space allows you actually to feel more dynamic, but but supported by something mm. bigger doesn't keep your dynamism uh, either solid or overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Right. But the support of something bigger, I think, is so important yeah. for so many of us. I, I mean, the problem of aloneness is yeah. likely a fairly ubiquitous human situation. So when I looked for spirituality to begin with, I'm like, why did I even go on a spiritual path as I start to realize how corrupted that word has been? And (laughs) it was like, well, I was kind of curious what happens after death. There was that big question as that's a big thing for me. Um, And also not to feel so alone, like what's beyond just this little mini me, you know, that search for truth where you feel a, a part of it all in a different way. Yeah. Well, I'll just say a little, you know, just the, just cause I was just looking at, uh, what's called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Mm, sure. But Very I'll just say, say a little something about that cause why not, uh, <clears throat> so the actual translation is, is, uh, the Book of Natural Liberation, uh, that, uh, in the, in the state in between, that liberates you in the state in between. And the description of the first part is, if you can realize the interconnected awareness, energy, bliss here, recognize it right away because that's who you are. And then you'll have no problem because that's what death is like. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so these descriptions, which, you know, near death experience, you know, the loving light, yeah. that that's what it's like. And then the rest of the book is... If you don't happen to recognize this because you never recognize it in your lifetime, then you got to go back. Now we got the rest of the book. Let's talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I figure in some ways that's one of my main things I've been starting to say in the beginning of saying, look, I'm going to introduce you to this, whether you believe it's helpful for the, for death or whether it's helpful for now and death. Either way, it's kind of what's real and what they're saying is, is the, the realization of what it's like, what it feels like. And when you feel that, um, you feel, you know, you realize it's not, it's not the gap. It's the, it's the bliss. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> Thank you what so a relief. much. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Woo! I it's feel it. Yeah, you feel it, right? <laughs> yeah. I feel it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we can only, we're just for everyone listening, we are scratching the surface. Locke has a long history 
Um, he had an awakening experience very young in life. I'm very young. I should put quotes around that. I mean, but young in life and you've been a psychotherapist and you've been teaching. So just go read his book. And maybe even if I could offer some advice, listen to the audio, because yeah. At the end of the day, sometimes these concepts are so amazing. They pop something open. It's like, oh, but usually it's the practice. It's something that actually gives you the support to shift yeah. that creates like the real alchemy, mm -hmm. you know, the real landing pad in a whole new operating system. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, you know, the book is trying to give a full map, you know, of it, but the, the, you know, the menu is not the meal. You know, you <laughs> can't eat the book. <laughs> you can right. eat the book. If there's nothing else around. It's okay. But, yeah. But, <laughs> but literally the, 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 the CD, the three CDs, I kind of go through most of the practices in kind of an order. Uh, and if you can get the first sense of what that is, that, that awareness is unhooking from thought, and opening to space and then becoming aware of spacious awareness. And I go through it kind of step by step. So you get this first part and I'll get the second part. And then I'll have you do it for external types, which is going out. And then I have it do it for internal types, which is dropping within. Mm -hmm. So you go so far within like a microcosm that it opens up. Mm -hmm. um, cool. So there's tends to be two types of people generally, uh, some people are told go within. They can't go within. They just open up outside and they and they connect. So mm, different learning styles, different doorways. Right. But the main to come back to kind of the thing you were saying that it's really that um, it's it's not the information. It's not the once you have a good enough map, it's really getting that you can shift into something that's already safe. I mean, that's part of the good enough map is that it's not dangerous. It's not death. It's, it's, there's something there, but then once you get there, you're not going there to transcend. You're going there to come back. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, so you don't get spaced out or blissed in. <laughs> 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 which I've been in both places. <laughs> yeah, yes, we can relate to that too. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for all of your work and for yeah. talking with us and for sharing all of this. Uh, I, absolutely. I really love talking to both of you and you're doing some great work and, and you're sincere and, and helping people, I think, with, with uh, bringing, bringing this to a lot of people. Thank you. It means a oh. lot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's show and we are of course oh so very grateful to Locke Kelly for taking the time to speak with us today if you want to check out his work some more you can go to lockkelly.org and that's spelled l-o-c-h the book we were referencing throughout the interview is shift into freedom and the audios that Vanessa specifically pointed out right at the end there is titled effortless mindfulness now which is available as a course through sounds true and really if you want to go beyond concepts about shifting consciousness and just go on ahead and have the good stuff, we both highly recommend this audio course for doing exactly that. Locks, pointers, and explorations, as I think you just heard, are very masterful and really useful and not long and complicated. They don't require moving into a cave for 30 years. <laughs> We'll, of course, have all of that also linked for you if you don't have a pen right now within the show notes, which live, as always, at blissandgrit.com. Our member platform is at patreon.com forward slash blissandgrit, where you can donate to support the show and also have deeper conversations with others about this path and get some other support resources, too. And it keeps the show totally listener supported. We are very, very grateful to those of you who are supporting us already, whether it's through the member platform or just listening today or passing this along to your other spiritual sensey friends. We're grateful for the reviews you've already written and uh, all the notes that you send us and all the good ways that we get to check in with you and get to know all of you guys. We'll be back next week. 